Okay guys, so this is going to be the signal transduction phase, right? So you've already had the signaling molecule has been taken in or is binded to a receptor and then which is most commonly the G protein and then that's changed shape and been activated and um so now we're ready to move on to the signal transduction phase. Okay, and in this phase you have two different really important proteins to remember. So you have a protein kinase Okay, and so remember, kinases are the ones that phosphorylate other proteins or enzymes, and then this usually activates them. Of course, it can also deactivate them, though, depending. So you have your kinase, which phosphorylates, okay, and it usually will phosphorylate, or usually it will transfer that, that um, inorganic phosphate group to a serine or a threonine amino acid. And kinases are extremely important um, because they regulate a very large amount of proteins in the cell. And the second one is a protein phosphatase. Okay, so phosphatase, and it's pretty much in the, in the name of what it does, it actually removes the phosphate group and it will inactivate a protein or an, or an enzyme to shut it down. So... Um, these balance or the balance of these two regulate the activities of the cell. So essentially what I mean is an activity of a protein can be regulated by the phosphorylation depending on, depends on, um, or I mean, what am I trying to say? Let me reverse. So the activity of a protein that's regulated by phosphorylation will depend on the balance in the cell between these two proteins, so between a, an active kinase and an active phosphatase. Okay, so if we get to the actual picture of a phosphorylation cascade, this is what it looks like. So you have your signal molecule or your ligand coming in to bind the receptor protein, okay, and so that in, in turn activates a relay molecule, which is just another form or way to say protein. It's a protein. Okay. And so then when this relay molecule is activated, um, that activates protein kinase 1. Okay. And so then protein kinase 1 then phosphorylates the inactive protein kinase 2 to make active protein kinase 2. Okay. And so here's your little phosphate group. And then once that's active, then that will also activate or phosphorylize the inactive protein kinase 3 to make active protein kinase 3. And then there's your little phosphate group, right? Okay, and then same thing. So eventually we get to the, the protein that we're actually trying to um, use to control a cellular response. And so when we once we get there, then the same thing happens. You phosphorylate the inactive protein into the active protein. And there's your little um, phosphate group. Okay, and then you have your cellular response. So that's pretty much the gist of a phosphorylation cascade. It's really, like I said earlier, it's like setting up a bunch of dominoes next to each other, flicking one of them, and then watching the whole thing roll down. Okay, so sometimes um, in a transduction pathway, you don't always have proteins. So like if I go back to the phosphorylation cascade, you don't necessarily always have these proteins. Sometimes what you might have instead are what we call second messengers. And they are they're called second messengers because technically your first messenger is going to be the signal molecule, right, or the ligand that comes in. And so then your second messenger is going to be either CAMP, C-A-M-P, or cyclic AMP, or it can be calcium ions. Okay, so CAMP or cyclic AMP, and this was actually the picture that you guys saw earlier with, with the added protein kinase A. So cyclic AMP, um, it's made just by dephosphorylate or hydrolyzing ATP. Okay, so you're taking adenosine triphosphate and you're knocking off two of the phosphate groups, and so then you're left with cyclic AMP. Okay, and we do that through the enzyme ad adenyl, oh my goodness, <laughs> adenyl cyclase, okay, and so here's your adenyl cyclase, and that's what's happening here. So you're hydrolyzing the ATP into CAMP. Okay, and then um, in order to get just regular AMP, which 
you don't need to be too concerned about this actually for AP. So I'm not going to go over that. But as long as you know how to get cyclic AMP or CAMP from ATP, then you're fine. Okay. Um, okay. And then the other one is the calcium ions. So the calcium ions can also be used as a second messenger. Okay. So for in this instance, you know, you have your signal molecule that comes in, it binds to the G protein or the G protein linked receptor, which has the G protein on it. This is kind of a misleading picture again. Okay. And so then that diffuses, once it becomes activated, it diffuses across, it activates phospholipase C and then phospholipase C will activate um, PIP2 and DAG. And then those activate the second messenger IP3. Um, and then IP3 can then go through the IP3 gated calcium channel and it can cause the calcium ions to move into the cell because there's usually a low concentration of calcium ions in the cell. But so that's why we can use it as a second messenger because when you add more calcium ions into the cell, then it can trigger responses of some, of some kind. Okay. And that's going to be it for this part. Um, so the next video will have the response.